Showtime. Showtime. After decades of puckish troublemakers, unconvincing imposters, and creative takes on the trope. Techno pagan is the term. <laughs> there are more of us than you'd think. Mr. Robot presents a hacker that's rarely seen in media. One that's believable. Granted, earlier works like Stieg Larsson's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo provide much of the source material that informs Mr. Robot, and there's been more than a few nods to that particular story's influence. But Sam S. Mill's turn with the vigilante hacker is perhaps more nuanced than any other in making sense of existing technology, how someone could use it to impact society, and what kind of person would choose to do so in the first place. Professor Candace Delmas defined political vigilantism as a crime that's meant to affect an existing political reality. When classified information makes its way to news outlets or proprietary government software is leaked online, an authorized custodian or an unauthorized third party committed a crime and did so to impact a standing political order. This includes massive corporations and private institutions, which are governing bodies in their own right. When Elliot's not at his all-safe desk, keeping Evil Corp safe. He's chipping away at corporate America as a political vigilante. His motivations for doing so, and also his sister's, begin in childhood, where a pattern of tragedy and trauma was endured with the help of two movies. First, there's Back to the Future Part 2. Marty McFly arrives in a futuristic hill valley where his older self happily consumes fake food and fills his home with unnecessary gadgetry in the hopes that he'll escape the pressure of a corrupt boss that ultimately costs him a job that defines his existence. Read. Here, unchecked capitalism is defined by how power concentrates at the top and the misery it spreads to the masses. Mr. Robot's thematic connections to this appear in several places. Back to the Future Part 2 takes place in 2015, which is the year Biff Tannen erects his pleasure paradise and comes to rule Hill Valley. Mr. Robot premiered in 2015. That's the year Elliot took the fight to Evil Corp, and where it has remained so far. But it's also the year a casino owner with a love of gold and self-portraits announced his run for president. Screenwriter Bob Gale emphatically pointed out that any illusions between this version of Biff Tannen and the sitting US president were by design. This concentration of greed and corruption also influenced Sam Mesmill's take on unchecked capitalism, from Elliot's initial monologue on the 1% to filming locations and blatant references. It's trending on Amazon's movies and shakers. It's ahead of Trump's latest. Can you believe that cocksucker is actually running this time? But anyone who wants to know how Esmail truly feels just needs to check his Twitter feed. He's not shy about sharing his opinions. Another childhood favorite for both Alderson kids is the careful massacre of the bourgeoisie. Clearly what the film is doing is debunking the notion that American society is classless. Meritocracy my ass. Long live the oligarchy. It's been present throughout the series. But those references have no origin until a flashback to Halloween 2014. Elliot and Darlene watch an 80s slasher movie where rich kids get their heads smashed in by a formerly dressed killer wielding a sharpened polo mallet and hiding their face behind a twisted Monopoly mask. Albert Bandura's social learning theory argues that children of a certain age process direct and vicarious experiences in ways that are almost impossible to distinguish. Preschool children observed an adult model beat up and inflate a boba doll in novel ways. Now the children who had observed the aggressive modeling adopted much of it. These experiences support one another as children age, informing their adaptive schemas and shaping personality, like Edward Snowden's love of video games pushing him to blow the whistle on the NSA. Elliot's New York and Hill Valley might as well exist in the same 2015. Our hoverboards aren't the same, and dehydrated pizza really isn't a thing. But like Marty, Elliot has experienced the tethers to jobs that stress and demoralize employees, even when they're off the clock. How the ability to pay defines the comfort one is allowed in life, and how participating in this system serves to embolden the Biff Tannins of the world. Elliot and Darlene's father, Edward, developed cancer when they were young and they always suspected Evil Corp, his employer, was to blame. It would take 20 years for Elliot and Darlene to get evidence of Evil Corp's inaction at the Washington Township plant that resulted in Edward's death. That's 20 years of Elliot visiting Future Hill Valley, an urban wasteland where the powerful prey on the weak, while remembering the father that first brought him there. 20 Halloween nights where Elliot and Darlene vicariously experienced the murders of wealthy young people, many with parents not too different from Evil Corp executives. 
When Elliot and Arlene first form F Society, they turn to a movie almost no one remembers, reminisce about a father that's gone, an abusive mother they ignore, and direct their shared anger at a known enemy with a calculation that's only possible through much deliberation. It's the processing of information that was first introduced when they were young, which is further evidenced by their secrecy. Members of F Society, and even lifelong friends, can't penetrate Elliot and Darlene's bubble. This is the result of a support system they maintain to survive their troubling home and move out into a world they see as hostile. You guys always thought that you were smarter than me. You never actually hit it that well. When Mr. Robot calls for the dismantling of corporate America. Meet these demands or we will kill you. Consider yourself warned. He's calling for an end to a world Elliot has dreamed of since Edward was first diagnosed, using the language of a horror movie he still shares with his sister. Darlene, with similar attachments, seizes the opportunity to kill Susan Jacobs, an evil corporate attorney who helped conceal her employer's crimes. It's no coincidence that Edward Alderson's birthday and Elliot's attack on Evil Corp occur on the same date. It's easy to support violence in fiction even with vigilante hackers. But even with sound narrative justifications, like a sister that seemed always willing to turn towards violence and a separate personality pushing him in the same direction, Elliot never crosses that line. Rohit, a successful businessman and sexual predator, is a familiar character to Elliot, one that bullies people into silence with his standing, extorts deference through threats, and, when that fails, resorts to bribery. These tactics don't work on Elliot. Instead, the self-professed misanthrope confronts this evil by calling the cops. Elliot's vigilante hacks collect sufficient evidence of crimes committed, so police or federal agents respond with urgency, and so prosecutors have a strong enough case for a conviction. He does this even when it's unclear if the target's behavior or intention is destructive, even if he's given personal reasons to like them. Vigilante tropes typically fall into one of two philosophical categories of justice. Utilitarianism, upholding justice as defined by a legal and or moral code by deterring crime, rehabilitating criminals, and incarcerating them as required to best benefit the community. And retributivism, where justice takes the form of a punishment that is at least proportional to the crime in question, though it can exceed it if deemed necessary, is intentional, is inflicted after a crime has been established, and is meant to send a message that society won't tolerate certain actions under any circumstance. They're very different approaches. You run around this city like it's your damn shooting gallery. Yeah, what do you, you do? You what do you do? You act like it's a playground. You beat up the bullies with your fists, you throw them in jail, everybody calls you a hero, right? And then a month, a week, a day later, they're back on the streets doing the yeah. same goddamn so, thing. So you just put them in the morgue. You're goddamn right, I do. You ever doubt yourself, Frank? Not even for a second. You never think for one second, shit, I just killed a human being who did a lot of stupid shit, maybe even evil, but had one small piece of goodness in him. Maybe just a scrap, Frank, but something. And then you come along and that one tiny flicker of light gets snuffed out forever. But regardless of which side a vigilante chooses, their method of setting things right is almost always communicated through violence. This calls their motives into question. Are they fighting to uphold the integrity of the law? to maintain an orderly society. We don't live in a world that's fair. We live in this one. And I'm doing everything I can to make it a better place. Or to settle a personal vendetta because the justice system failed to do so. I think that this world, it needs men that are willing to make the hard call. These people, they took my children from me. They killed my kids. Don't you get that? It's never really clear despite what the vigilante may say or do. Because focusing on a bad actor, above all else, means things like the ritual of law and victims of crimes are given secondary consideration. Sometimes they can almost become an afterthought. The question then becomes, is the vigilante acting to bring an ideology to a society in need of direction or to fulfill a selfish interest? Maybe it isn't only about justice, Matt. Maybe it's about you having an excuse to hit someone. Maybe you just can't stop yourself. I don't want to stop. Elliot, the political vigilante, practices restorative justice, fixing a situation so it best benefits the victim of a crime. His primary concern is the victim of any situation, whether that's his best friend, a next door neighbor, or billions of people with consumer debt. 
with the victim identified, the crime is understood, and it informs Elliot's plan of action to set things right for those he sees as most vulnerable. That means any money you owe these pigs has been forgiven by us, your friends at F Society. Elliot's motto, fuck society, has little to do with people. His anger is directed at corporate power, government failures, and a culture that promotes competition and consumption over genuine interaction. For the most part, Elliot is disappointed in people for giving in to the fear that keeps society going rather than live authentically. It's one of the stronger thematic connections to Fight Club, another obvious inspiration for Mr. Robot. I see all this potential, and I see it squandered. God damn it, an entire generation pumping gas, waiting tables, slaves with white collars. But it also lines up with Jean Jacques Rousseau's concept of the social contract. Rousseau argued that pre-social humans, living at a time before civilization, had little or no interest in material possessions and had no concept for competition. This made for people who were internally complex and generally altruistic. This was the opposite of Rousseau's Europe, the early days of the Industrial Revolution. Manufacturing sped up, goods traveled further, and money made its way into more hands, irrespective of education or social standing. It's the start of capitalism as Elliot comes to know it, but the benefits extended to the average person fail to keep pace with the development of technology. In order to maintain the flow of invention and production, which keeps capitalism moving, people are encouraged to consume and compete. Rousseau's concept of self-love encourages the desire to have, or more correctly, the ability to buy, in order to maintain standing in the eyes of others. This leads people to become ambitious in their professional lives, only to be crushed by economic realities. Why those who have look down on those who don't. And why many make the effort to present a life that's more impressive than the one they actually have. All this is necessary to keep people distracted, so they won't concern themselves with the actions of the powerful. If they do, society as it exists might be in danger. Class separation and the inability to break free leaves many wondering, why can't the world just take care of itself? This is difficult to answer. Rousseau conceded there's no way to find the error in society that changed pre-social humans into modern ones. And if he could, there was no way to turn back. Elliot is largely asocial, allowing him to better see what's wrong with society because he's outside it. But his complex inner world isn't just the result of thoughtfulness. It's informed by a conversion disorder, depression, and anxiety. To make sense of this, Elliot engages in talk therapy with his psychiatrist Krista Gordon, sometimes alternate personality Mr. Robot, and his secret friend, the audience. And to help him limp between these conversational partners, he relies on a combination of prescribed and recreational medications. But even with a mental health status that isolates him, Elliot is not the only subject under constant psychoanalysis. Philosopher Gilles Deleuze and psychotherapist Felix Cattery thought of people as better than the society they inherited, but by the late 20th century, it became more convoluted than any other period. Deleuze and Cattery argued that modern capitalism couldn't exist without creating anxiety. People avoid this by agreeing to be part of structures of exploitation, servitude, and hierarchy, and suppress any innate desire to challenge them. The invisible hand that's meant to guide people towards decisions that personally enrich, and by extension support society, is backed up by the lingering fear of having essential needs denied. For Deleuze and Guattari, society manages this collective worry through a misapplication of psychological treatment. Certain antisocial behaviors, those with no direct impact on others, but are unacceptable by social norms, are pushed into a realm of fantasy. This distorts a common understanding of what the concept of freedom actually covers. If there are only certain acceptable ways of living, freedom has boundaries. Then freedom becomes not freedom at all. And that covers the whole of society, as the spectrum of antisocial behavior is broad enough to include almost everyone. Mr. Robot points to this with numerous shots of the Freedom Tower, lingering above and behind people moving through society. With this building as a focal point, Manhattan assumes the identity of a panopticon, a circular prison with a tower at its center. This design allows guards to observe all prisoners and their activities regardless of where they are. With nowhere to hide, the inmate population feels compelled to police itself, using the rules established by the correctional staff. It's what Michel Foucault called 
power reduced to its ideal form, free from obstacles. The metaphorical central tower becomes a true figure of political technology, a way to convince people it's in their best interest to observe and encourage what they're told is acceptable behavior. Misunderstanding what freedom means in a society with boundaries confuses how the mind is understood to function. It becomes a theater, a place where actions can be directed or corrected, where routine is necessary in order to achieve a desirable presentation of what a person ought to be. This is the opposite of what Deleuze and Gattachy understood the mind to be, a factory that is always active, always producing. At his most anxious and depressed, Elliot fights with himself for not sticking to Krista's treatment. His mental illnesses require routine and medication to allow him to interact with the world. Mr. Robot, a manifestation of Elliot's most rebellious traits, tells him that embracing his asocialness is exactly what those in power don't want him to do. Think about it. You don't remember me, you don't remember your own goddamn sister. You see that shrink, pop their pills. They intentionally put you in this haze, fog up whatever brain matter you have left in there, so you forget what they want you to forget. They're trying to control you, Elliot. They've been trying to control you all along. On the more relatable end, Darlene denies her anxiety disorder and panic attacks as anything special. Trust me, in this day and age, it's sicker not having panic attacks. Since when did pretending everything's okay suddenly become the almighty norm? In other words, everyone is under the same level of stress at all times. They're just expected to manage it and push on. It's been further co-opted by society in support of capitalism. Chill corporate offices, Dove beauty campaigns, ads praising workaholism. It's easier to be submissive when those who submit don't feel oppressed. And their enthusiasm can be earned if they believe their choices make them free in some way. Commodities pretend to offer choice, and choice becomes a commodity. Some go a step further and willingly seek out watered-down psychological treatment, packaged and sold as self-help. I place myself in alignment with the things I want. I dissolve all false messages. I dissolve all false messages. Nothing is beyond co-optation, not even a revolution. Jessica Alba says she wants to join F Society. Where does this leave political vigilantes? Elliot and Darlene realized that deleting the world's consumer debt didn't do much to save it. And in the wake of all this chaos, people who were true believers in the cause, and survived, find themselves wishing they'd never taken part in the fight at all. This can be attributed to S-Society still being at Stage 1. While it's still unclear what Mr. Robot and White Rose had planned for Stage 2, aside from the destruction of a specific skyscraper, we do know that Elliot and Darlene anticipated a broken world after the hack and readied themselves for a long war. But what Elliot and Darlene may have overlooked is the lasting influence of society. Consumer debt does help the global economy run, but that doesn't address the problems that originate in capitalism, yet bleed over into other areas of life, like alienation, existential nihilism, and nativism. Evil Corp was the perfect target, not just because of their crimes against the Aldersons, but because they take part in every aspect of consumption banking, electronics, agriculture, and now currency. Renewed faith in them after 5-9 could mean that society winds up where they began. But people would have resisted the collapse of the old world regardless of Evil Corp's survival. Elliot understood that most people lacked the resolve needed to endure the destruction of something familiar, and put in the work to make something new. He even fell victim to such a fear when Mr. Robot put into motion a plan he wasn't sure he wanted to take part in. Maybe we should stop it, Darlene. Stop what? The plan. The hack. Everything. Maybe we shouldn't execute it. What? Why? So it comes from a place of mutual understanding when he asks us to exercise a little patience. Because a new world is still possible. How do I take off a mask when it stops being a mask? When it's as much a part of me as I am. We keep fighting. Like the world we unmasked. We will find our true selves again. Maybe after wiping away the thick, grimy film of Facebook friend requests and Vine stars. We can all see the light of day. I know we haven't talked in a while. Maybe you only trust me about as much as I trust you right now. But I'm gonna ask you to have hope for me anyway. Just please, 
have hope.